on oh my god bad cut but that's the song sorry i'll here we go i'll make it live so everyone can hear it there we go all right so hey you know it's informal but it's mike here from njcb and we're doing another facebook live so um thanks for tuning in for those listening and uh i'm here with a couple people tonight some of which you've seen in the past with us but um you know we're all socially distantly apart and talking beer talking uh mead talking new product talking what's happening in the um beer world and the alcohol beverage world and uh and talking about you know living in jersey currently so uh i got john here from south jersey beer scene he's gonna say hi and then pass the mic and we'll start talking and of course guys leave your comments and anything you have to say below so we can get them popped up on the screen here and and engage who what you guys are asking about Hey guys, it's John from South Jersey Beer Scene. We're at sjbeerscene.com. We cover everything south of, we're not going to get into South Central Jersey argument, but we cover <laughs> Ocean, uh, Burlington, Camden South. And I'm going to pass it up to my friend, Mr. Gattulo. Uh, I'm Al Gattulo, and uh, I do a, a little craft beer show on the weekends uh, out of New York on the radio. And then we put a podcast, uh, podcast version up on Monday mornings. Not only do we talk about New Jersey beer, we talk about New York beer, we talk about all kinds of beer uh, all across the nation, and also focus on small businesses which have been hit so hard uh, during this pandemic. And I like to drink beer, so I'm having one right now, a little Twin Elephant Battle him, and uh, I'm going to pass it over to uh, to Sergio. Hey, everyone. Yeah, Sergio Mosella here. Um, I own uh, Mellow Vino Meadery in Vauxhall, New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey's first meadery, one of the most award-winning in the world, three years in a row. Uh, all done from the back of a mall in New Jersey, which is more impressive, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, glad to be here and you know talk shop, see what's going on. Yeah, the the mall has a weird history, and I think I might have told you that a, a few times. But the mall where Milovino is, um, back in the day, my grandfather used to take me to the hot dog shop when I was a kid. Um, Tabachniks. Yeah. Well, Tabachniks is the soup Used factory there, yeah. was yeah, Delavino yeah. before that. And in the front, there was a famous like a hot dog place called Sid's that my grandpa used to take me to all the time. So, yeah, it's got a fun, uh, random, uh, like, you know, circle life kind of thing. And then, of course, when my grandfather passed, he was buried across the way or his funeral was across the way staring at his favorite hot dog place, which is even crazier. And that's when we ended up making a mead with with uh, Sergio for my grandpa, and that was a yeah. a random thing when we were just drinking, and I I was probably drinking way more he- uh, more heavily, but uh, it turned into hey let's make a mead. So yeah, it was uh yeah, it was, it was uh, fun. Sergio black, does some you do these yeah, black shoes Betty it was called yeah yeah black shoes Betty we made it um to to release at the Central Jersey Beer Fest when beer festivals were a thing we could do. Um, hmm. They will be eventually a thing we could do again. Um, so, you know, hopefully that will be a thing that can come out. And if you guys tried that, thanks. And if you didn't, you might be able to again. But again, Sergio makes some interesting meads. I think you just released a Christmas gingerbread thing. Tell me, tell us about that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we always try to t- stay seasonal, at least with, especially with our draft meads. Um well, like set well session strength in the mead world at least but uh uh yeah we did a gingerbread cookie belgian double inspired mead basically uh so i've gotten into this whole like brewing cra- um uh beer style meads where i literally just make believe i'm brewing a beer uh but i'm replacing all of the malt with honey but other than that it's i'm i'm it's they're more of like a a beer made from 100 percent honey than they are a mead kind of a thing but yeah total all honey fermentables uh for this one in particular i teamed up with a good friend of mine matt Potensky. uh he's a big belgian beer guy and he has this belgian double recipe that he makes every year and uh three years ago he came to me and said hey do you think we could translate this into a mead and i looked at the malt bill and i'm like oh yeah we could take uh you know, we, we could do this to get that character from like the special B. We could caramelize the honey a little bit. And so we kind of deconstructed that Belgian double and we brewed it as a mead. But knowing that like my mead drinking clientele 
isn't really going to be super stoked about like a Belgian double on ta- a Belgian double style mead even on tap. I said, let's give it a twist and make it like a gingerbread cookie Belgian double mead. Uh, so we threw in, you know, so basically we caramelized all the honey that we used. Um, we uh, we added a bunch of candy ginger, allspice, cinnamon, dark Belgian candy syrup. Uh, we got a fresh pitch of yeast from East Coast Labs. Uh, we used uh, a really nice Belgian Abbey ale uh, for that. Um, I mean, it, it came out spectacular, man. It's this was our third year making it, and like every year we fine tuned it a little bit, but this year we just like knocked it out of the park. Like it was phenomenal. We called it uh, "Catch Me If You Can." Huh. That's a yeah, cool name, Sergio. I gotta I gotta ask you real quick because I'm not a I'm not a mead guy. I've never really dabbled. Uh, in the meat thing, the pro- so the process is the same as making a beer. You're just substituting the honey. No, no, not at all. Actually, um, for making these beer style meads that I was talking about, yes, but right. normally it's actually a lot closer to making wine. Uh, okay. So, so we're not heating anything up. There's no mashing process. There's no boil. Uh, it's we're in the simplest form where we're just taking honey and diluting it with enough water to kind of bring the sugar content of the honey down. Um, And depending how much we dilute it down, like the sweeter we start, the sweeter the final product will be, right? Uh, So much so we could actually, we can, you can make a dry mead. Not a lot of people know that, but you can make a dry mead just because it's made from honey. Doesn't mean it has to be sweet. Although our customers have have proven to us time and time again that they want the sweeter stuff. So, I like the drier stuff, so I still make them on the side, the drier, off-dry mead sometimes. But for the most part, we kind of we have to give the customers what they want. It's like I sure. feel like it's like owning a brewery and not making a hazy IPA, you know. Right. So, right. You know, but uh, yeah, they're all awesome, <laughs> and uh, the the process is very much more like winemaking um, than anything else. Yeah. Okay. Search, yeah. do you, do you find that you appeal more to the wine people or to beer people, or do you think it's kind of a split? So depends depends what do you mean about wine people. So like real like, people who really take wine serious kind of like, you know, throw they're not watching here. <laughs> yeah. They throw their nose up in the air and they're like, "Oh my god, that's so sweet." And I'm like, "Geez, you just you should taste the other meads on the market." Uh, <laughs> cuz we the our, our highest sweetest level that we normally go to on Melovino is like a third of the sugar of the residual sweetness that like a lot of others go to. We do that purposely just because that that's my style. Um, but um, yeah, most like serious wine drinkers will kind of yeah uh, just pass it on by. Um, but I would say I don't know. I think like your casual wine drinker and also like just old, in general craft beverage enthusiast is more or less our clientele. I would say um, it's you interesting because remember like drinkers doesn't oh, necessarily have like a, a die hard like mm-hmm. this is all I like and that's it but they like to experiment a little bit and of course obviously the craft beer you know cider just craft beverage in general enthusiasts just obviously love drinking everything right. yeah my, my wife got into the peanut butter and, and uh peter and Joe, peanut butter and jelly sandwich like she's not oh, a yeah. huge uh beer drinker and busted out that like <clears throat> that that mead and it, she's like whoa this is delicious you know and it's <laughs> like and you know it's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in mead form. Um, we did have a couple com- uh, questions slash comments. Um, people are really f- excited that you're using the East Coast yeast, and who's not? Um, Al Al makes some amazing, cultivates some amazing yeast over in uh, at East Coast. Um, oh, I refer to Al as my new best friend. Everybody yeah. knows who my new best friend is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Love he, he he's a an amazing yeast cultivator. Is that what I call him? Um, and yeah. then. One of the questions is, how long does it take from start to finish to make a mead? And I guess it depends on what kind of mead, but it may be like one of your, yeah. you know, um, and and then I had follow up was if you open a bottle of mead, how long does it last? So, all right, good question. So in short, as far as uh, how long it takes to make one. So there's in general, like two main styles of mead, and um, they're usually they're usually referred to standard strength and uh, session meads. Um, I never really liked the term session meads because in the beer world, the only people who understand what the term session means are, you know, uh, people in the craft beer and the um, you know craft beer scene. So they understand like that's probably going to be like a three and a half to four and a half percenter. 
a session meads in the mead world can be like six and a half, seven percent. And that's usually where they're at. So um, but like so I call them draft meads for those. We could turn around uh, those in like two to three weeks, you know, like let's just say similar turnaround times as as the beer side of things. Uh, the standard strength meads, which are like 12 to 14 percent alcohol, like we can knock out fermentation in about two weeks. But obviously the higher alcohol um, is going to like require just a little bit of like a, a little bit more time just to like mature a little bit and kind of settle out, round out a little bit. So it doesn't taste too young. Um, just, you know, just because of the nature of the higher alcohol. Uh, basically, but yeah, so more or less, yeah, either two to three weeks or let's say two to three months for our standard strength stuff. Um, as far as like how long does it last after you open a bottle? I, I think it really depends on the mead. Uh, honey is like the, the, like the only food source in the world that never spoils. And I think the preservative qualities, even though it's only like honey is only like that because it's so low in moisture content and also very acidic which a lot of people don't know. So it's super inhospitable to spoilage organisms. But as soon as you introduce more moisture in the form of like water, diluting it like we're doing to make feed, it, that, that all changes. But I do still think somehow the preservative qualities of honey somehow still kind of like um, are in effect in a finished mead where if the more it is just honey and water, I think the longer it lasts, um, it's the, the longer it takes to oxidize, I would say, uh, after opening a bottle. But the more fruit component to that mead you have, like the, the, the fruit meads will start oxidizing a lot sooner than something that's just honey and water. Uh, so perfect example, I think it was two years ago. No, sorry, three years ago, we opened up uh, a bottle of one of my like OG bottles from 2014. Uh, I opened it up at uh, Bolero, uh, at Bob Olson's house for his holiday bottle share. And um, it was a bottle of Symphonia. Like, it's just three different honeys fermented on three different oaks. And we opened up a bottle of that. And then the following year, I went back to that bottle share. And I saw a bottle of Mellow Vino open, like, in the back of his bar kind of a thing. And I'm like, what bottle is that? It was the same bottle from, like, the year before that still was, like, maybe a third left in the bottle. And uh, everybody wanted to drink it. And I'm like, no, no, no nobody's <laughs> tasting that. Uh, but sure enough, everybody insisted we drank it. And it was totally fine. Um, so it was that was pretty crazy. That was the <clears throat> oldest opened bottle uh, of meat I've ever had. And honestly, it was it was awesome. man. So it all kind of depends. Yeah. So which, when you're making the honey, when you're picking your honey out, I have a question. I'm sorry. So. I know that we have people like uh, in Hamilton that get the honey that's made at the blueberry farm, oh, you know, yeah. that they use to pollinate. Do you, are you able to do flavor profiles by the different types of honey? I'm not familiar with honey, but I mean, is that something that you guys do? Oh, for sure, man. Uh, all the time. Uh, it's actually, in fact, it's, it's very rare that we only use one honey in a recipe too. We, I like using a blend of different ones. Um, just think about it like in the grape wine world, like different grape varietals give you a whole different final product in a, in a wine. Same thing with honey varietals, right? So every, for every floral source there is in the world, there is a different honey varietal and they could be drastically different. I mean, like opposite, uh, opposite ends of the spectrum are like, you know, like a, an orange blossom honey from Mexico is super, super light in color and like, um, sweet white flower a little citrus and like orange marmalade character to it uh compare that to like a ridiculously dark buckwheat honey which is you know smells and tastes like you know a, a petting zoo and horse's ass kind of <laughs> uh, you know, that's you know, my pet name for mike by the way <laughs> oh sweet very like a good name for me <laughs> yeah uh, so, yeah, different honey uh, varietals make a huge difference uh, in what we do. So, like, um, I'll just throw one other example out there, or, or one example is, like, our apple pie mead. Uh, instead of diluting the honey with water, we dilute it all with, like, freshly pressed Jersey apple cider from Mellick's Apple Orchards. And we've been working with them for years. Uh, so we ferment that out, just the honey and the cider, and then we age it on vanilla beans and cinnamon. Uh, it's like apple pie in a glass, but like, I think the real secret to that recipe 
is actually one of the honey varietals that we use is this super awesome clover blossom that uh, from this one particular source we get it from, it has the smell and taste as it's it's so identical to like having like apple pie filling pop out from like a cut in the pastry dough and caramelize in the oven. That's what that honey uh, tastes like. Wow. Right. So it's yeah, honey different honey varietals make such a huge difference. Hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And and Sergio, for the for the gluten free crowd, mm -hmm. this is meat is very popular for them, right? Because there's no there's no gluten in there. It's something that they can drink and enjoy without having to uh, uh to to deal with you know all the gluten right yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah for the most part uh yeah mo most meats are all gluten free uh the only times uh i mean we've made some recipes that you know we'll throw in an ingredient that contains gluten like uh like our no bake cheesecake uh, uh recipes where it's like vanilla and graham crackers mm -hmm. so graham crackers right. obviously contain uh gluten there but we'll always list those ingredients uh, and make it super obvious, but, and the only other time that I still have to kind of get it tested, but I, I always warn people just in case, because when we make our beer style meads, we'll use liquid ale yeast, which is normally, uh, you know, grown mm -hmm. in a little bit of wort. So, right. you know, I'm afraid that there might just be like small trace amounts, uh, of gluten in there. So for somebody who has like a serious, you know, uh, you know, celiac disease, for example, like, you know, they can't have they can't even get close to that but right. uh but for the most part those are like very rare circumstances for the most part yeah everything we make is is gluten free cool uh, very cool it's it's uh it's pretty interesting you know when when we when uh well, when was it this summer when i went to the came to, to the meadery for uh i think it was yeah it was it was a nice summer day came to the meadery get some stuff oh, yeah. to go it was hang out for a little bit um and the uh like even in a day when you were, you know, uh, not busy, it, people were flocking in all day long to try to get stuff and people were coming in and out and buying meads and like buy the handful of bottles. And like, they were like, as if they were buying a four pack or multiple six packs, you know what I mean? Like there was just people come and go. And it's not just, you know, these, uh, these beer people or mead people, it's just all kinds of different people trying these new things, trying these, these beverages. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Like there's no, um, I think the way you've made your meads and because you're also a beer nerd and a beverage nerd in general, that like yeah. they're, they're appealing to the, the mass, right? So like I'm looking at my cellar right here and I've got one of yours on the shelf there. Actually, it's the peanut butter sandwich one. Um, and I have, you know, these stouts and I have the IPs in the fridge and I've got these sour bottles and it's like, you know, you add up uh, a bunch of different kinds of beverages and, you know, um, my cellar is much smaller because of COVID, but uh, it, 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 it was pretty large. Now it's slimming down, but that's a good thing. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty cool to see all these different kinds of beverage consumers trying all these new things. It's, it's fun. I, I, I mean, I enjoy that. I think it speaks to like, I still consider myself like a home brewer at heart, to be honest. So it, it uh, I think it speaks to kind of like what we do at the meadery where we just have like a ton of fun. You know, it's um, we have like three or four recipes that are like our, our biggest sellers that we distribute out of state as well. So we always try to he keep those in stock. But besides that, anything's a go at any given time. We're, we're just going to ex keep experimenting and have having fun with it, trying to cross, uh, you know, try, try to like weave together like different beverage styles. Uh, like when I started making these beer style meads is a perfect example. Um, you know, so we made like IPA style meads. Um, mm -hmm. Shit, I made an American Pilsner mead that I poured for Garrett Oliver at Brooklyn Brewery. And he was telling he was asking me, like, there's no, you're telling me there's no malt in this. I said, <laughs> no, nothing. Um, so we've been having a lot of fun with that. Now I'm playing around with like uh, different styles of Brett meads. Um, I'm given another shot at a stout style mead which has definitely been the most challenging because how are we going to get all that color and maltiness and roast character without being able to use any malt whatsoever. So I think I have a, I think I have an idea, which I'm actually going to be trying out next week. We'll see how that goes. But um, yeah, it just, just goes to kind of show like, yeah, we just have a lot of fun with everything, man. And uh, so there's always something new to try basically. 
And and Sergio, I got I, I got to ask because this is the the journalist and the interviewer in me. How has um, how has COVID affected your business uh, in terms of obviously people coming in and and sampling stuff, but also um, you know take out and to go and and all kinds of because obviously you do things differently. And I don't know if you're distributing or not to other places or you're doing all your sales uh, at your place. How has COVID affected your business? Oh man. Um... It's hard to complain because everybody else is going through the same shit, basically. Right. Um, that's probably one of the most frustrating things about it. At least, you know, we could vent sometimes uh, when we have complaints, but we can't. Um, but, yeah, like we, we've been distributed in like seven different states. Um, and it's not like beer distribution either with our mm-hmm. like with standard strength style meads. It's like we might send a pallet or two maybe a year to a state um because me just takes longer to move off the shelf um so uh distributor orders have basically disappeared uh we have one of our seven distributors that have been actually still ordering from us throughout the year um and they're in georgia so you know there's like no rules down there so <laughs> still party time um and uh but besides that yeah like you know in-house uh obviously our tasting room was was shut down just like everybody else is for a few months Right. Um, we started the outdoor seating, uh, when we were able to, and, you know, that helped a little bit more, but I mean, all in all, man, it's, you know, I speak to some of my, uh, some of my colleagues in the industry that, uh, here in state that own breweries and, you know, we're sharing stories of like how much money we've actually, we've lost this year, you know, right. and it's insane, man. You're talking well over a hundred grand and in every case, <laughs> um, right. Uh, and some a lot more than others. So it's it's been really difficult, um, especially for um, I think everybody's having a hard time, obviously, but especially like in the mead scene where it's, you know, there's not a lot of people that will drink like mead every day. You know what I mean? Like I even, you know, I'm drinking beer right now. You know, I drink right. a ton of beer. Um, that's why I started making the draft meads, because at least they're lower alcohol. I could drink more of the draft meads. <laughs> but in the wine world, there's a saying, it takes a lot of great beer to make great wine because uh, you can't drink <laughs> wine all day and expect to get something, anything done. Um, right, right. But it's but mead isn't really necessarily like that across the board. Like not everybody's drinking every day. So we don't get as much uh, um, like repeat business from the same customers as often, I would say, as like uh, a brewery would have. Uh, so it's a little tougher on our side. Our products are more expensive as well, just because honey is the most expensive sugar source in the world. Sure. Um, so we we have like our our own little sets of challenges, just like everybody else. But I mean, we've you know we've been trying to figure it out, man. You know, I I always try to think ahead and try to think of how we could adapt and what we can do. And I'm always trying to think like three four months ahead, you know, and um. But, you know, luckily we've been able to keep the lights on, uh, been, you know, since we opened up the tasting room business with outdoor seating, especially too, uh, we've actually brought on more bar staff, uh, just so that way everybody's like a little bit less exposed compared to if they worked three days in a row, right. uh, we have more bar staff that we rotate out a lot often, a lot more often. I upped their, I upped all of their hourly pay, uh, to 15 bucks an hour. Wow. Uh, just, um. You know, give them a little something to just say, hey, you know, I appreciate you guys. I don't want you guys leaving with, you know, shit tips at the end of the a day running drinks back and forth between outside and inside. And right. It's been crazy, man. I've picked up a few sh- a few of those shifts and it sucks, man. Like <laughs> it was so much easier when you could just go from the bar to a table. Right. Um, I don't I don't honest I honestly don't get why people at this point why are you you're not tipping heavier on top of you know what you would normally tip. Like you know the, the, the small business is the lifeblood of America, right? I, I, I talk about this all the time on my show, but the, the, the bigger thing is these bartenders and waitresses and these business you know, these people that work in these businesses, they're working for tips and they've they've made no money. I mean for a, a you know, a large portion of this pandemic from March until, I mean, when did indoor dining start back up in, in uh, Jersey? July, right? New York didn't yeah, get it. after July September. 4th. Right. So, and then you're talking about in New York, it didn't start until September. 
So these people rely on these tips in order to in order to survive. So anytime I go somewhere, I'm tipping yeah. 30, 40, 50 percent on the bill because I know they need this to survive. I don't get people that come to a place and are annoyed because they have to wait an extra five minutes or 10 minutes for a beer. And, and they go, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to tip them. That's ridiculous. You know what? Get here to go and go home. I mean, you don't belong there. I know Mike and I were involved with Brewery Strong. And yeah. uh, you should see the stuff that we get with Brewery Strong with these people that are just like, you know, my son works for one of the bigger craft beer purveyors here in South Jersey. He's down to two shifts a week. They're just trying oh, wow. to keep the doors open. And, right. uh, you, you know, it's 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 craziness. But I, but I will say this, you know, I think it becomes like delivering the mail. So we're getting mm-hmm. used to being in this COVID. It's like right. delivering the mail. You know, every once in a while, your mailman will put the wrong mail in your mail and somebody else's mailbox. People have just become accustomed to like, well, that sucks for you, but I'm not changing the way that I operate because we're in it. So I'm, I'm in it for myself. There's a lot of that going on around, I think, too. And talking to the people in the breweries and talking, uh, you know, Mike and I and you, we talk to these people all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're trying to do they're being asked to give more to other causes like I'm sure you are, Serge. Everybody's knocking on your door saying, hey, give the brewery strong. Hey, give to this. Hey, give to that. And this business in general is very giving. And I think that at some point there's a kind of a balance where you just can't do it anymore. And I think we're running into a lot of that kind of giving fatigue. And uh, I think that's what we're seeing out there. And God knows that, you know, if you can afford to go out and have a beer, you can afford to tip somebody a little bit more than what you would normally tip. You're going out and doing it, but we're hearing it from everybody. I mean, we're talking to people now that are saying, the owners are just going to be here waiting tables because they don't want, they want the guys, to, the kids to get laid off so they can actually pay their car, you know, their, their, their car payment and their insurance right. because they're not going to make it working two shifts a week at a really good place to work. So it's tough. It really stinks. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It was uh, in the beginning of it all when <laughs> we noticed the big difference in the beginning because what uh, what we did immediately, and it was hilarious because when I, the, the day that uh, the governor issued um, the notice that we, that all places basically were shut down, uh, tasting rooms were all shut down. I called my brother. I was already home with my, with my kid uh, with virtual learning and, uh, I called my brother up who works for me at the meadery and I'm like, dude, you believe this? Like, I think we're probably going to have to be closed for like two or three weeks. Like this is going <laughs> to right. little do we know. It's like, oh, dude, like what's it been eight months now? Um, and, um, but the craziest part was, you know, in the beginning we kind of noticed like, Hey, you know, this actually isn't going too bad. You know, what we started doing was, we started doing our, our, our draft meads and cans and, and started selling them online where before we never sold outside of the meadery. If you wanted our draft meads, you'd have to come in and we'll, we'll do 12 ounce crowlers to go kind of a thing. But right. other than that, you couldn't get our draft meads anywhere. So we figured, Hey, let's put in cans and ship them out. You know, uh, we're able to ship to different States and all that. And so that went really well. We would do like a new can release every like two or three weeks and, uh, online orders were pouring in and I'm like, oh, this is awesome. You know, this is actually not going to, this is not going too bad. But as soon as we kind of noticed, like uh, by this, by the summertime, when everything opened back up, things started slowing down when everybody stopped getting that extra $600 a week from unemployment <laughs> yeah. and it really <laughs> slowed down. Right. Um, so, but yeah, it tips wise too, though, like around that time, like in the beginning, we, I noticed like the, I was really happy to see that or we call them our, our mead tenders, uh, they were all getting really well taken care of as far as tips. Uh, and I was really happy to see that everybody was really uh, stepping up and helping them out. And um, but yeah, as the months have gone by, it's 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 changed a lot, man. And I just don't know what all the, the different nuances um, are behind why that might be. But I mean, it could just be as simple as you know, more and more businesses are closing, more and more people mm-hmm. losing their jobs. Um, savings that they were relying on to survive, hopefully just a one or two month like deal uh, are running super thin. And, you know, you, you just never know, man. Right. Uh, you don't know what the reason is. So it's it's tough to kind of like, you know, can't yell at customers to tip more. Um, you know, my staff is great, so it's not like they deserve shit tips and or anybody else in any, any other place. But 
Uh, and I think just people are just hurting, man. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's getting tougher and tougher. I, everybody's everybody was talking about how sad it is, like how many businesses have closed since March. I always say, wait until you see how many businesses close between now and next March, because I think yep. that number is actually going to be greater. Whoever is still managed to survive and hang on by a thread, especially in states like, you know, like like Jersey here in the Northeast or anywhere that has a cold winter where outdoor seating isn't realistic. Uh, I, well, we're all more or less fucked for a lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's going to be really, really tough. This this is going to be the most challenging time for, for businesses. And, you know, I, I, also, I also think, you know, we talk about the outdoor seating. There's situations now where people, you know, the governor extended the outdoor seating until March 31st. People that we know in this industry, they changed the way that they can get permits to put these outside structures up and they're taking them down. Yep. Our, you know, our good friend Tori over Backward mm-hmm. Flag, I don't know a more charitable person. In the, and I love everybody. I'm just dying right now. Tori, I think she gives all of her money away. And she hates when I say that. But she's constantly in the community um, doing all this stuff. She has the bunker outside in her parking lot. She has a really good community presence. The township told her to take it down. They're not going to give her a permit. She has just lost all that business. Can't keep people safe. She basically is in a situation where the governor says we can do this, but the local township ordinance is saying you got to make it the same way you would make a permanent structure, which is asinine to begin right. with. And so now she's, you know, there goes that little bit of resolve that she had to pay her people. It wasn't to put money in her pocket. It was but, to pay her people. But don't you think, don't you think from the local municipality standpoint, that's tax revenue. That's revenue to the local town. Like why wouldn't you work with them to make it more viable. Jason, that Icarus had the same issue with, with, the, with the township. He wanted to do an outdoor thing and they wouldn't let him do it. And then the, the guy who owned, I guess, the uh, the property where his brewery is or whatever, was giving him a hard time. Like, dude, like, why are you, why are you putting roadblocks up to prevent people from making money? It's revenue for you as well. Like, I don't understand that. <laughs> None of it makes it's, sense. It's, and it, it, it changes every second. So it does, but, but you know what's funny? Like the local, t- in the local place that I that I have here in town in Clark and Mike, you've been there, Paragon Tap and Table. I don't know if you've been there, yeah. Sergio, but because yeah, yeah, um, I know you're place. in the bike. So w- what they did, the town came to them and said, "We'll work with you. Whatever you need to do to stay open, we're going to work with you to to make sure that you you're able to stay open." Now they took their outdoor stuff down because obviously the stuff has to be snow rated and whatever, and they didn't feel like spending. The amount of money that they had to spend, and they said, you know, we'd have to rent it, and we'd have to make. I think it was like fifteen hundred dollars a week to rent. So now you're talking, you got to make double that just to make profit. And yeah. for them, it wasn't possible enough, you know, to do that. But the township at least was willing to work with them to say, whatever you put out mm-hmm. outside, we'll approve it, you know. And and as long as you're bringing in money and you're keeping things safe, we're cool with it. We're going to get the tax revenue from you, and you're going to keep your business open. I mean, that's it. The people don't seem to understand the local government and the state government doesn't seem to understand. You need to work hand in hand with one another. They don't. Yeah, yeah. They, they don't seem to get it. And they're I don't I've I've heard this from multiple, multiple, multiple people, whether it's a bar, or restaurant like Paragon or 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 um, or a, a brewery or or, you know, a winery or whatever. Like these these different every uh, business has a different approval approach on every level. And then the towns or the county, if the town doesn't have that department in their town, right. they have to answer the county or the local group of them. Like certain towns have the county that does the health department. So like if there's a mm-hmm. COVID issue and you go to the town and say, oh, blah, 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 we don't have a health department in that town. You have to go to the county town. The county town right. says something else. They tell you to, they tell you to contact the state police. The state police said, "Huh? What are you talking about? That makes no sense. Mm-hmm. We're not in charge of that." Then it says, "No, ask your town." The town says, "We have." They, you're you're yeah. going back and forth playing this triangle of of who to talk to, and I mean, mm-hmm. I think that it's all like, I don't want to say like they're trying to just play the the game of like the shell game of moving things around, but they're trying to like figure out who can handle the different aspects and it has changed too many times that none of it makes sense and that eventually 
like I don't know, like are they 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 need to get their shit together? That's for sure. And yes, right. the towns have to talk to the businesses. The towns got approved for the business to be there. Why wouldn't they want the business to st- to stay there? Like right. especially sure a sense. small, especially a small family owned small business. Like the, you want a mega corporation to come in? They just you know you don't need more warehouses of nothing. You just like these small businesses like are the way to go. Obviously, but like it's just just interesting well it, it's it's the same thing in new york city right and i've talked to a number of people in new york city and and, and it's obviously it's on an even bigger scale in new york city so if the restaurant can't open or the bar can't open they can't pay their rent because most of them don't own their own building they're renting it from somebody so now the renter can't pay the mortgage the bank you know doesn't get their money and it's a trickle down effect exactly yep i don't understand why Either the federal or the state government needs to step in to help these people. What what Cuomo and de Blasio have done in New York saying, well, we know that the transmission rate hasn't increased by indoor dining, but we're going to shut it down anyway. That's absurd. You're, you're, you're putting all these people out of business for no reason when you're telling people follow the science, right? And, and then you don't want to follow the science when it says, oh, yeah, this doesn't contribute to it. I, it, you know, I, I just get so frustrated. And uh, a buddy of mine just opened a brewery in New York, and uh, right outside the Holland Tunnel. Um, uh, John Danzler and uh, and his partner uh, Joe just opened up Torch and Crown Brewery. They're literally three minutes from the Holland Tunnel. It's a great little spot. They set up this outdoor dining that is phenomenal. Like, I mean, a beautifully built structure on the sidewalk that will, will hold up and withstand. And I'm I'm hoping they survive, and they just opened like two months ago. So mm-hmm. how you open in a pandemic, New York City is just like wow. You and know? now we have down here in the South, we had you know our friends over at the Seed have been trying to open Atlantic City, a town that is starved for right. some sort of destination that needs people to come, other than to sit in a shit in casinos for sixteen hours. <laughs> right. Two of the nicest, finest people that we know. Sean and Amanda that own the seed, the mm-hmm. the amount of bullshit I'm sure they had to put up with to just be able to dispense cans out the front door is ridiculous. And I'm you know I'm drinking one of their beers right now. If you get a chance to get their beer, you got to get it. It's yeah, I got I got I got to make a trip down. I have the next two weeks off, so I'm, I'm I can meet you halfway. Oh, mm-hmm. all right. Well, um, John will have to coordinate that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just that these guys are trying to open up a business. They invested their life savings, their blood, sweat and tears. They got a beautiful place and they can't open it because they're waiting for what other inspector to come in and say it's okay to open. Right. I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous. And, you know, um, these are towns that are starving. They want people to come open businesses and this is how they treat them. Same with John with the beer fest. They want them to come do the beer fest, but then they want to put all these restrictions on them. And charge them top dollar for the biggest event that comes to Atlantic City every year. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's, you know, down here, that's that's what we see, you know, because we're more rural than where you guys are. Right. And Atlantic mm-hmm. City is the big venue. But I would I would bet dollars to donuts if we could pull, you know, if we could pull stakes on everything in Atlantic City and move it somewhere else. We'd be better off. It's, but it's, can't it's, see the forest through the trees. Yeah, right. it's insane. And, and And then there's been breweries that have opened in the central or north part of the state during the pandemic, um, including like um, 40 South and Edison, and they opened just fine, no problem. Like, <laughs> like boom, you know, and, yep. and it's like, wait, how did, and they have indoor and outdoor and, you know, to go, everything else. But, right. um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's tough. It depends on where it is, you know. Um, yeah. And I, it, none of that makes sense. And I mean, it, it does if you have lived in New Jersey for more than, I don't know, four months um <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure all, all of it makes sense and nothing makes sense it's new jersey um but yes new jersey is like this new york is like this pennsylvania look what they just did over there by yep. closing the bars but i mean you've goose got some, island closed in philly did you guys know that yeah yes. like out of business yes. and so did some other very old like very um Yes. Very classic Philly like beer bars. And then yep. people like um or monks in Philly is selling their their Cantillon bottle collection just to like <clears throat> like selling it to drink off prem because they can't be open because right. they can't. I, I just I don't know. But you know what it's, I find interesting? I, what I find interesting, and I'm not the biggest fan of Governor Murphy, but I, I do find it interesting that 
he he said, okay, you can't sit at the bar and drink, but you can stay in the restaurant until, you know, whatever it is. And that seems to have worked, you know, for the That's last, here. you know, month or so, whatever it is. No? So down here, no? all they did was make the bars places you can eat food and just kept it the same. That's what I'm saying. So they're saying, oh, you can drink here now, but you have to order food. So the bartenders are still working. Like, I know places that I go to, I'm like, you know, that I fully understand why they're doing it. And I'm like, you know, that's kind of, you know, what I, I mean, I think he's done as good a job as he possibly could. You can't win as the governor right. in any state with this. Right. And I mean, New Jersey's like three different states at this point. So, I mean, right. uh, or you know, you, there's ways to circumvent every single rule that's in place. Exactly. It's, oh yeah, and, absolutely. And everyone has done it. I went to a place that, like, the first day that um, they did indoor dining, and they're like, "Here's your glass of water. You can take your mask off now. Let me know what you want to drink." And then, like, we're in the bar. You know, there was not. It was under capacity. It was fine. It was quiet. But they're like, as soon as we give you a, a glass of water or whatever, now you're technically eating or drinking. I'm like, oh, okay. So otherwise, yeah. like I went out somewhere else, and it's like mask until you're uh, like, whatever. Right. I'm over it. What are you guys drinking, by the way? Everyone's asking on the on the comments here. Oh, uh, uh, that I just finished. Battle him from uh, Twin Elephant. I have another one, but I have to be up at three in the morning, so you know it's back to uh, it's back to water for me. So, so I have uh, I have the seed. I have their um, uh, this is their um, uh. English inspired dark ale, really, really good. And I'm sipping a little whiskey, but don't tell my wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I've got a. Um, I'm a dark beer guy. Um, I like my oatmeal uh, oatmeal stouts and dark lagers and stuff. So um, yeah, I came put out this uh, Hollow Sea a few weeks ago, and I picked up as much as I could get of it because it was it was killer. So. Nice. And I'm having a, a turmeric and ginger uh, white tea. There you go. All yeah. right. I, I got a I question. I got a question. Earlier, so. uh, I got a question for the three of you. What during the pandemic, what is the best beer in New Jersey that you've had? Oh. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just what's the what's the one that sticks out in your head? I know which one I liked, my favorite. But technically, it was like a seltzer. But tech, not right. really. It was like, the, it was the Muckraker, uh, Muckraker's um, cherry, uh, their, their uh, Frambois seltzer. That was a cool shift seltzer. <laughs> it was it was like a 3.5% second runnings of a cool shift Frambois. So it was like funky sour tart seltzer and it was three and a half percent alcohol and it was refreshing as hell okay john i got i got i got two uh, uh ludlum uh put out a uh barrel aged stout that was roasted with the coffee beans from harry's that's next door to them mm -hmm. um that was friggin fantastic i think it was aged in uh jim bean barrels um really 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 good and right. uh, this, I will say, as a as a as a whole, the stuff that Amanda has put out and uh, and Sean has put out the seed, uh, the uh, all New Jersey hoppy ale that they put out was really really good. It was really impressive to see uh, what they did with that. It was it was great. It was a little earthy, but had that little hoppy bite to it. Um, I was really impressed with that. So that they they beer. were my two. Yeah, it was great, wasn't it? Yeah. Sergio? Oh, man. Uh, I just kind of like like them all. If I don't, I just drain pour them. I don't talk about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, honestly, the ones that stood out was cause just because it was so different from what most breweries do, and it was just so well executed, um, was uh, Twin Elephant. I'm a big fan of theirs, good friends with them all there. And um, they made uh, Tim over there. He poured me. I forgot everything that went into it, but I believe it was something like a, a guava lime, like um, possibly kettle soured. I don't remember, but he I passed by over there like in the middle of the summer, uh, just to drop off some be uh, drop off some meads actually to them and say hey, what's up. And, and it, it had been uh, some time since I seen him. And yeah, he poured me this lime guava, um, uh, you know, 
possibly kettle soured beer. I forgot what it might have been called. Uh, but that was definitely one that stood out to me for sure uh, throughout the past few months. Nice. Oh, I also the, forgot uh, about I also forgot oh. about my other favorite, the Icarus Build Me Up Butternut. Since I uh, I was waiting for that one because <laughs> I'm staring at it right now, and it's right. It was really good, and it was canned for the first time uh, ever. The the, the day have, that was great. The the day that I saw you, Mike, at Source. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was that before Thanksgiving, right? When you were talking about uh, putting this together, yes. the fall saison, which I ended up not getting in cans because they had oversold, and so um, I ended up getting a pour there. That was unbelievable. I mean, I, think I, had I it, could yeah. have had, I could have had ten of those, mm-hmm. and I would have needed an Uber to go home. But boy, yeah. that was that was fantastic. I really, would, I can say as a, as a whole, there's been a lot of great beers that have been coming out. Um, a lot a of stuff that wasn't available in cans, I mean, that you can get in, in different places. Uh, Slack Tide just came out with uh, a barrel age morning bite, their stout that they were making. And I can't, and they're literally two miles from my house, and I haven't found a way to get over there yet. Um, Tuckahoe's come out with some really nice stuff this summer. And Kate May has come out with some real, the, Co, the Coquito that Kate mm-hmm. May put out for Christmas, 14%. I drank, I felt like I could have drank 20 of them. <laughs> because they were so not boozy. Yeah. How about nationally? Any national stuff that you guys saw out there? I had a favorite. Okay. You know, I'm probably gonna get tortured for it. But what did you got? What do you what did you see out there this year? Um, I, to be honest, I don't even think I bought anything out of the state. And if I, I mean, have, it was like a trade because it was just uh, it was just easier not to. And there's been nothing that like I. I mean, I've had uh, so I had friends come over and like brought me some stuff from Brooklyn, and 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 I went out with a, a bunch of friends uh, upstate in the late October, in early October, and I had a bunch of beers from like the PA area that friends brought, and like mm-hmm. some stuff from up north and like the northeast. Um, so I had a whole bunch of stuff, but I didn't really buy anything from out of state, so I don't remember. <laughs> Brooklyn Brewery sent me um, their uh, their chocolate stout that they aged with uh, Four Roses bourbon, and they actually sent me a bottle of Four Roses bourbon, which was like, oh wow, like <laughs> this is a cool gift. And then they just brittle that that I guess they made from the bourbon uh, this bacon brittle, which was fantastic. But actually, a buddy of mine from California, he owns a, a Loaster Brewing, and they did a beer a year ago uh, for the band Live. The guy's a big fan of live. He decided he was going to do this uh, copper rail uh, to celebrate the 25th anniversary of throwing copper. Contacted the band. The band was up for it. They did the beer, and uh, we became friends, and we started talking, and he sent me this uh, fruited sour, this peach persic zur that was unbelievable. It was just light, fruity, had that real good peach puckery um, kind of taste to it. That was unbelievable. I was happy he sent it. I said, you should send me three more cans. It was so good. <laughs> yeah, I had a couple things sent to me, but that freaking KBS, those, those, uh, there's a the Mackinac uh, fudge. That Mackinac fudge, man. I'm gonna tell you what, it's like crack. <laughs> Is I mean, it? Because I not... have a bottle in my fridge that oh family sent me, and I haven't had it yet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and get. You gotta through. let it sit though. You gotta let it sit and warm up. I'm gonna tell you what. I went okay. out and bought some, and I haven't bought beer in a liquor store, and I don't know how long. Right. You know, I went to see my friend Jordan over there at Circle Liquors, and said. Yo, dude, do you have any more of this laying around that you wear? And he's like, yeah, let me go get you some. But I, I was suitably impressed. I know Founders has a bad rap with some of the stuff they were doing, you know. Right. Whatever, you know, whatever. But that Mackinac fudge and the espresso, good derivatives of that KBS that, you know, you have to like the KBS. It's like one of those beers that you would drive three states to find. Yeah. And, it, and it was amazing. I was I could not believe that I was saying that, but it was really, really, really well done. Yeah, I've been sticking to as as I normally do, just just drinking local Jersey beer, man. I just try to support my my uh, my colleagues here in the industry. And and uh, luckily for us, there's quite a few good ones. <laughs> yep, there is. Yeah. That is true. I mean, I, I, I don't want to say we're spoiled, but I think people um People that hate on Jersey and don't come and actually explore a lot of the Jersey stuff that's around here, and it's all over the state. It's not just South. It's not just Central. It's not just North. There are a lot of good places. Like, and I'll, I'll be honest. I'm, I maybe I'll catch heat for this, but 
Um, Magnify, I was not the biggest fan of for a long time. I felt like I felt like a lot of times they didn't cold condition their beers enough. There was always this like acidic burn every time I drank one of their beers. They have very much impressed me in the last year and a half. I, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know if they have a new brewer. I don't know if they're doing something different. But their beers have been consistently good. Like every time I see them on tap now, I'm like, okay, I want to get that. Like we all go for the Boleros and the Brick Cities and the you know the standards that are that are doing the great stuff. But it's nice to see when a brewery that you had a few of them and you're like, ah, I'm not too crazy about it, and now suddenly they've stepped it up and, and their their beer tastes that much better. Well, I think also during the the last eight, nine, ten, whatever months, a lot of the breweries were able to hone in on some of their recipes more and and like mm-hmm. tweak them until they were able to make them perfect. Now they didn't have the ability to have a tasting room tastes of those but they were able to like really try them and like you know as for example the build me a butternut i mean i did the exact same thing this year with with icarus that i have done in the past except this year i eliminated like the five pounds of sweet potatoes and was just substituted it for more uh butternut but uh at the same time we we made the beer and it just for some reason it was the pepper combo and it was a tweaking and ideas and what we kept for and it was the best one there's been. And it's a lot of the breweries are able to do that now. Like, mm. And because they can't have it all, you know, on draft, they have to make them perfect and a little bit better or more improved and keep tweaking it um, because it just it does change, you know. And then sometimes mm. the breweries or often I've seen now recently the, the breweries have gone back and like really um, re-released their core brands. Right. I know mm. how many times I've seen. Twin Elephant since, uh, I mean, since we're all talking about them, since Twin Elephant really keeps really uh, releasing the Swarm and releasing all the um, all the Wu-Tang beers. I mean, um, love that one, by the way. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Because <laughs> the honey. It's the um, only Twin Elephant beer I've ever had. Really? really? Come on, Swarm really? was good. Wow, you're yeah. missing out. Yeah. yeah. There's some but, good stuff. Heard is the word. It was really good. And then you know I've seen I've seen the, all the core brands coming back out from like uh, from Slack Tide from Brotherton who um, also opened their tasting room during COVID. Mm. Um, you know their their brands are back out there and um, Brick City you mentioned them before Al Brick City has keeps honing in on all of their jam series and like oh. you know and they keep adding different ones but they're like perfecting each one right. and. You know, it's it's great to see all this stuff, and a lot of this stuff is not is also now available at a lot of liquor stores around the area. So if you can't and get in to South Jersey, yeah, well, yeah, you know, this year, um, yeah, well, because you know, of the, the sales guy Kevin is killing it down there. Well, um, you know the the other thing about I think the other thing too about the breweries that is really cool is a lot of them are going back to doing. Lagers and pills, oh, there's and that I doubt. The traditional stuff that you haven't God. you haven't seen because obviously the hazy yeah. IPA was you know the big deal and we've got to get it out there and we, you know everybody loves it even though that's not the traditional IPA or whatever. But I love the fact that breweries are now like you know what we don't have the tasting room we have time to let beer sit in tanks for a little bit let's make a lager let's make a pilsner and make it really good that's what yeah. I love I think oh. that's awesome. Yeah, 100%. coming from a guy who makes like peanut butter and jelly and apple pie style <laughs> beverages, I like a good classic beer style, man. Like right. that's what I prefer. Like sometimes I would feel bad. Like I just started telling some of my buddies in the beer industry that, uh, you know, they would just hand me a case of beer. You know, we, we normally would just trade off some like you know some mead for beer and stuff all the time. But like sometimes when I get like gifted like beers that with like fruit extracts and this and that, I'm like. No, just give me like, you know, just give me like the regular stuff. You know, I'd right. much rather just drink that. And I'm kind of glad that I think things are going back to that. Uh, I think you're right. Um, uh, you know, everybody's starting to make some more like cream ales and colches and mm-hmm. uh, some lockers are popping up here and there. Um, I like that. I, that that's yeah. what I like. Tim's I'm drinking, Tim's beer, drinking beer. Ticket. Tim's culture wet ticket is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's one. one of the best that I've had. I love it. I, I you know, I want him to, I want him to can his Hefeweizen because he hasn't made it in a very long time. But he makes one of the better Hefeweizen that I've had in a really long time. It's just, it's a simple, clean beer that you can have a few and not feel, you know, uh, that you're going to get, you know, overly, you know, whatever, you know, can't drive a car. So uh, it's good stuff. 
Yeah, it's a uh, you know speaking going back to Twin Elephant um, and talking about Colshes. Yeah, we did a collab with them last summer. Um, I think it was the last summer. Yeah, I think so. And uh, basically, we did like a parallel collaboration, which was super cool. Um, basically, we wanted we had like the same recipe concept, and I was gonna make it in mead form, and they were gonna make their beer uh, version. So what it basically was was a, a lemon honey Kolsch on their end, and then mm-hmm. on my end. I was going to make a, a lemon Kolsch style mead, uh, but we were going to use the same yeast, literally. So they brewed their Kolsch at the brewery. And once they harvested their yeast, they drove it over to the meadery, and I fermented my mead with the same exact yeast that fermented their beer. Oh, wow. So it, like, it really kind of like integrated both recipes, tied them in uh, with one another even more. Uh, and we released them on the same day, actually, on National Mead Day weekend, uh, which was awesome. So we had customers going back and forth between both of our places, which are 12 minutes away from one another. Right. Um, But uh, yeah, they were, that was like one of like my favorite beer style meads too. We had, they actually gave us enough of the coal sheets that we were able to make like two other batches with it. So we made like two other coal style meads, like one with ginger and one that was just like straight, um, uh, straight coal mead. But yeah, those guys are awesome. And I, I, I always try to make sure anybody from out of state that comes and visits us, uh, we always try to send them in their direction. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So, um, so yeah, go, go ahead, ahead John. No, you go. No, go ahead. No, you so, go. So, no, you go. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll go. So the one thing that's amazed me this year more than anything else is the amount of breweries and that have opened, that have been able to get open. Mm-hmm. We've had a significant amount of breweries and, knock on wood, not any closings to speak of. We've had a couple, obviously. I mean, you're going to have that in any business, but I am shocked of the, of the amount of breweries that have been able to open and, and been able to stay open. It's, it's been pretty crazy. I mean, Mike, you talk to these guys all the time and the, you know, the Dr. Brew Littles and mechanical and, you know, all these guys that open up in the middle of a pandemic and they're doing well. Um, That's pretty, pretty crazy. It's, it's pretty cool. And they're, and they're all, like um to Sergio's point before everyone is the the community at large like i went to mechanical and there was nine other breweries there and right. it was a you know it was great to see all the different breweries there hanging out um having a good time and and a lot of you know these guys are doing their thing um and it's cool the collaborations and whether it has to do with on the front end or the back end like you know oh do you guys have like you know extra uh, pack techs or do you guys have extra cans you can trade a minor on order like that kind of stuff and they yeah. like you know kind of working together that way and at the same time like doing other things like you know like you make this mead you make this beer you take this you know all those kind of things it's great to right. see all that happening while you know people are, and people are buying the stuff so it's not like it's going to sit there taking up space and also a lot of the medium and smaller breweries are you know, crowlering and canning everything. So to the point where like, they're not making a 30 barrel batch of every single beer. They're doing like a half batch of things or, or a quarter batch of things to try it out. At the same time, they're making three or four different batches and releasing them. That's why you see so many cans every week and you see all these guys just opening and, and, and selling their stuff. And now they're getting shelf space, some of them out on the, in, in retail, but they're also getting like, certain bars and restaurants that are like actually bringing in new kegs, you know, they're getting all that out there. Um, that's the one thing that has, um, that that's the one thing that has slowed down is going draft draft sales to bars and restaurants that slowed down or, or growler station liquor stores. But at the mm-hmm. same time, um, I think that will pick up a little bit in as soon as like we can have, you know, 50% capacity or something like that. But, um, you know, I think it's it's great to see businesses opening. And yes, we have not lost any breweries to the pandemic in right. New Jersey. Um, we're also it's like, good. you know, doing um, there's uh, I think a distillery, maybe two have opened since. Um, I mean, there's just it's not just breweries, you know, so there's right. a lot. Yeah, well, there's two eateries that opened up right before all of yes. this started. Yep. Yeah. Open right. South Jersey, actually. Um, and um, yeah, I kind of really felt bad for them because they one of them had opened up in December and one of them opened up 
in at the end of January. The um, painted so people? Or, yeah. So what's that? Painted people or the people in no, Millville? I don't, think, I don't think they've opened up yet. Um, no. But it was Armageddon Brewing. And, yeah, Armageddon the Cider, yeah. Yeah, which, yeah, Mead and Cider, but the, neither of which are brewed, but we won't get into right. that. I like the guys over there. Uh, yeah, Armageddon Brewing and um, uh, Beach Bee Meadery. In, oh, in Long uh, Ranch, yeah. Long right. Ranch, yes, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I felt bad because I'm like, damn, we finally got new meaderies in the state, and and then this pandemic hits, and I'm thinking, well, wow, because taste rooms are shut down, so the majority mm. of their plans were basically, you know, just building that brand and getting people in to taste their stuff, and they don't have like the the inventory to to start distributing even in state, forget out of state, or possibly not enough packaged goods to sell online to ship out even. Um, so it was tough, you know. I've 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 kept in touch. Uh, I'll keep in touch with, with both of them, and we kind of started our little uh, New Jersey Meat Alliance kind of a thing to kind of all stay on the same page and work together with stuff, cool. uh, especially when it comes to, like, regulations. And um, But, yeah, it was just, like, it really sucked to see that. And, like, finally, new meteries, and then it was like – it's like Joe Pesci walking in to get made and he gets whacked instead. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was a little problem. We couldn't take it, you know, and that's that. That's it. You know, it happened. I'll tell you, you know, an interesting story. Um, brewery out in San Diego that I had visited uh, a couple of years ago, Society, which makes killer IPAs. Their entire business was their tasting room and draft um, bars. And they had just gotten a canning line, like, literally three weeks before the pandemic and they got it up and running like I think a day or two before the, the California had all these shutdowns or whatever and basically shifted. They laid all their employees off. Five days later, they brought them all back and said, we're shifting to a distributing business where, you know, putting our beer in cans, we're getting it out there. We're going to figure out, you know, what to do. I don't want to lose these people. And these guys are thriving now. They got their beer in, in Costco and, and uh, you know, uh, Sam's Club and all these different places or whatever and really like kick butt to get things done and and the guy was saying he's like it was a complete 180 shift of my business like I, I had to I had to do something to survive and they're in this little tiny industrial you know little strip you know with, with a little food truck outside they opened up a food truck business because California said you had to have food with the beer or whatever and they figured you know they figured <laughs> how funny is that it's amazing <laughs> yeah but, but it's amazing what you can do to be creative, you know, to keep things moving. And you guys know the San Diego beer scene is just, you know, is all over the place. And now I think they just signed a deal with Stones Distributing on to distribute their beer throughout the rest of Southern California. I just saw so, that. It just, just uh, came through yeah. a press release for that. Yeah, yep. it's good stuff. Yeah. So, the other that, thing that's happened, I think, and Al and I were involved with this, was the home brewing. We yes. both had home brewing competitions. And, yep. you know, our friends, all the home breweries, and, you know, Guy Carrado and, the guys at Keg and Barrel and the guys up north and and Eric over at uh, Fermented, we had a, a pretty big home brewing competition over the Garden State Brewery where my son-in-law is the head brewer. Just a little inside, so I could have it over there. And Saturday <laughs> they're brewing the winning beer. And oh, you have cool. one at Source. Yeah, Source. Uh, the guys at Source have been great. I mean, they came to me um, literally as the pandemic was going on, and. Um, and said, look, we want to we want to buy some advertising on the show. We want to support you. have been doing great stuff. And uh, they came in and we kind of collaborated on this whole thing about doing this uh, homebrewing thing. I was surprised at how many people um, really you know, took it apart because they were stuck at home and not able to do anything. And we literally, the first day we started judging, we were doing all Tuesdays in July. The first day we started judging, five guys, as we just started the bracket, were dropping their beer off. Like it was so cool. Like we're sitting in there, and these guys are like, "Hi, we have beer. We're supposed to drop it. Yeah, bring it in. Okay, we'll put it in. You're not up yet. You know, like we've gone through, you know, thirty something beers, and um, the two beers that ended up winning, um, the one guy's Kolsch, uh, Patty's Ales and Lagers, unbelievable. He came in second place, and the uh, Orso Ales uh, was the guy who won the um, this pink guava beer that every time we sampled it, we all finished our glass. Like he kind of just knew he was going to win from, from Jump Street. His, his beer was so perfect. And then we find out uh, during the interview uh, when we had the um, kind of the, the, you know, we did a live broadcast from Source. 
And we thought, yeah, this guy's brewed this 15, 20 times to get it perfect. The second time he had brewed the beer. And the guava that he used was a frozen guava paste from Walmart. We thought he was chopping up fresh guava. He's like, nope, they've got a little thing, paste thing from Walmart. Done. You know, unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah, we had a significant amount of entries and a, and a stout one. And it was uh, Eric Schmale from uh, Brew Jersey one. And, uh, you know, they're going to, they're going to, we're going to go do a little video on Saturday. They're going to go brew that. And, you know, when the breweries have been, you know, if I walked in and I said, you know, I have an in there and I'm like, Hey, would you guys brew a beer that somebody made and, you know, won this contest? Sure. Let's do it. We had uh, 12 judges from across the industry. We had uh, brewery owners and writers and, you know, a lot of, a lot of cool people that came out there and it was, it was really fun. And the rise of home brewing again, because people are stuck at home. I think in the next couple of years, we may see the second, you know, re, you know, revolution of people, you know, starting to brew. We had young guys too. We had guys in their twenties, like young that were doing this. And I was, I was shocked. We had a, one entry was two, two guys and their girlfriends. And uh, they were in their early twenties, like 22, 23. And they made a beer. It, you know, it was great. I mean, it was just cool to see. And that was one of the ways that we're able to keep connected with the community and right. such such a hard way to do it yep. uh, right now. But that that was going. And uh, I'm not going to lie. I stole the idea right from Al and did it as my own down here, down in South Jersey. <laughs> I'm going to blame Vic for that. I'm going to blame Vic for that. But that's- Vic's, listen, Vic's beer was good. It just didn't make my cousin into the contest. And he got knocked out by the guy's calls who, who came in second. And I said to him, I said, dude, his calls was lights out. He goes, at least I lost to the guy who came to second place. I said, I'm telling you, man. And he brews. We actually brewed a beer with him, my wife and I, a couple of people, uh, about three, four weeks ago at my cousin's place down in Ocean Grove. We brewed a uh, chocolate cherry stout and a, and a traditional West Coast IPA. And the West Coast IPA came out fantastic. I brought it to the guys at Paragon. And they all said, does he brew prof- professionally? And I said, no, he's just he's a home brewer and he works at – he works at Triumph and Red Bank and whatever and this and that. He, you know, he dabbles. He's been doing it for a number of years. They all thought it was like top of the line, like you can put it up right now. So that's cool. That's pretty cool. We had a guy there who was a chef who took the grains, the spent grains, and made bread for us that night so we could have bread with our dinner. So that was cool. Just like just like Fun Bobby does over there at Tuckahoe. He makes those, those grains for us. Fun yeah. Bobby. <laughs> So I think with that being said, we should probably rack up, wrap up here and uh, say good night and thank everyone for coming. Um, and if you feel like it, I'm going to let you, we'll go in reverse order. Sergio can plug whatever he's got to say and we'll cut out from here. If you guys, um, thanks for tuning in and all that stuff and uh, take it away, Sergio. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. This was awesome. Uh, I had a lot of fun. Um, yeah, if anybody's interested in trying some, uh, some awesome mead, uh, obviously shop around at the other meaderies as well. We all kind of need help obviously. Uh, but yeah, we're shipping, um, we're shipping off of our website, mellovino.com, uh, in-house we've got draft meads, which our draft mead menu changes literally on a weekly basis. Um, and also I just launched, uh, a new product under a different entity, basically doing honey water. Uh, so we call it Melly Honey Water. Uh, it's literally, it's not alcoholic, but really, really cool stuff. Just literally filtered water and and honey. Uh, and all of the flavors are literally just different honey varietals. So we're not mixing anything else in. It's super light, very lightly sweetened uh, and carbonated in a can. It's uh, it's actually pretty killer. So if anybody's interested in that, it's uh, uh, Drink Melly, M-E-L-L-E uh, dot com. Cool. Yes, I need to get uh, some. <laughs> well, Sergio, I'm going to come down and visit you very soon because I'm only 15 minutes from you, and I have to, since I have the next two weeks off, now I have no excuse not to come in uh, and see you and try some meat. Um, two things uh, real quick. Um, this week's uh, beer cast is going to be the last live show for this year because I'm off. So uh, Josh Wolf, the uh, great beer writer from the Chicago Tribune, is going to join me. I'm going to talk about uh, Bourbon County stout sales and stuff that's going on in the Chicago area. And then um, the uh, happy hour guys, are gonna, yes, great book, great book, by the way. Awesome. Um, uh, and uh, the happy hour guys, these two Broadway actors uh, who do this uh, beer show, they've uh, come out with a collaboration. It's called um, Curtain Up, and uh, Gun Hill Brewing is making it, but they're getting other breweries involved uh, around the country. I believe uh, the Part of Souls, Ross Brewing, um, a few others in New Jersey are going to take part in the collab over the next uh, you know, four or five months or whatever. 
and it's to help uh, Broadway actors who are out of work and uh, probably won't be back to work until uh, the fall of next year. And then we're replaying the Source Homebrewing uh, show uh, on uh, Christmas week. So uh, if you missed it, you definitely want to check that out. Just go to uh, am970theanswer.com or uh, you can go to my, my uh, craft beer page, facebook.com slash agcraftbeercast. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Hey, uh, I got two things real quick. First of all, thanks, Mike, for having me. Uh, thanks for all that you do for us uh, at South Jersey Beerson. We certainly appreciate it. And uh, I want to talk about uh, the thing that's really important to me right now is Brewery Strong. Uh, Mike is, sits on the board with me um, that we're at, at Fun Bobby Callahan's uh, <laughs> leisure. Um, Brewery Strong is an organization that was came out of Rob Callahan, who is the sales rep at Tucko's uh, Mind, that we're raising money for people that are in the brewery, bar, and restaurant business that are struggling during this time. Um, we've had tons of uh, support from breweries and a ton of other organizations. We've been able to give out uh, almost 200 grants to people, and we've raised almost $70,000. Um, you know, I like to thank Al, too, for pushing our calls. If you have the means, if you Great have a couple cost. bucks, go to brewerystrong.org, donate a couple bucks. 100% of the money goes right back out to people in the industry. I mean, uh, we're, we're really, really trying, and hopefully as the pandemic slows down we're going to keep it rolling and we're going to do some scholarships for people in the industry some training uh help people that are in need you know because we're underinsured in america so that's the big thing for me and for all the beer news in south jersey hit sjbeerscene.com um we do a every third thursday we do a live show with kate may brewing and then randomly we'll show up with stuff until things get a little bit more normal um but we're, we're out there so uh, thanks, guys. It was uh, great to be a guest here with my good buddy, Mike. Yeah, guys, thanks for coming. And uh, thanks, Mike. if you're still here, I'm switching it back to audio that you can enjoy. And uh, see you next time.